And again, specific. We have uh, several details in here, uh, but it's important because that most of transactions in the business business world they are related to the sale, the sale of anything. So we buy, they sell. We are looking at the Sale of Goods Act. So there's an act, there's legislation that applies to all sales or most sales. So the first thing is to uh, understand when the Sale of Goods Act applies. Uh, in any given transaction that it applies, the Sale of Goods Act will not apply if there's a contract that prescribes otherwise. So this act is aimed at filling the gaps. If parties have a sale contract, the contract will apply. The contract is the law. Alright? But if there are missing parts or silence in some of the aspects of this transaction, then the sale of Goods Act uh, will apply. And they apply to commercial transactions. They do not apply uh, <clears throat> they are not applicable or better. They are applicable when one company is buying products from another company to either use the products or to resell the products. So that's when the sale of goods uh, and we will apply. Goods and service. So this act applies to goods, not to services. So goods we know, tangible items, movable items. For example, there we have watches, televisions, books, even animals. Could be grown crops, etc. So the sale of goods will apply to them. The sale of goods act will not apply to real property, purchase or sale, not to real property, not to services, except if I'm buying the goods and service, the service is part of this purchase. The example would be if I buy tires, winter tires, and those winter tires are being installed in my car. So the service is along with the goods I purchase then it's okay. But if I just go to the dentist for a service, for example, the Sale of Goods Act will not apply. Okay? And for choices in action, remember what chosen in action is? Does anyone remember? <laughs> yes. It is there. So chosen in action. Any rights one has against someone else. So if I hold shares of a company, I have rights. So it's a chosen action. If I have a promissory note, if I have uh, any types of negotiable instruments, they are chosen in action. We, we saw in chapter 14 that they are uh, one type of personal property, but in the sale of chosen action, the sale of goods act will not apply. So just to goods, movable, tangible things. And title to the goods has to be transferred for the sale of goods act to apply. So if you go to Best Buy and you buy a new laptop, or if you go to Apple, or if you go to Microsoft Store, and you buy a laptop, so at that moment, you are making the purchase, title is being transferred to you. Before you buy it, title is held by the store. After you buy it, you can pay it at that moment, or you can pay it 30 days, depending on the creditor. But you are making a purchase agreement. There's a sale agreement as well. So at that moment, title is being transferred to you. Okay? You can also get delivery on the next day. So you can go to Ikea, buy some products, but if you don't, you cannot carry them uh, yourself. 
So you just schedule for the goods to be delivered in the next week or next days, but title is transferred at that moment because you have purchased the products already. So in this case, the act uh, will also apply. If the transaction is security a loan, if there's a loan uh, security with the collateral, that will not apply either. But there's an exception. If you finance a car, when you are financing a car, you are, you are actually buying the car. So that will apply. Even though the car is used as security for the financial institution, but that will apply because you purchase the car. But if you have your own car, you already have paid, you paid for it already, and you are offering your car to secure another loan you're getting, then it's a pure loan transaction, so that will not apply to this. Okay? Just if you're buying, purchasing the car uh, in a finance. Also, for exchange, purely exchange, the act does not apply. So if I exchange my laptop with yours, no money involved, sale of goods act will not apply. But if there's money involved, because your laptop is worth more than mine, so I pay you some money, then that we will buy. Okay? So when there's money involved in an exchange, then that uh, apply. So when does that apply? Or when does it not apply? That's the question for you. But if I buy something at a store, 
a movable for by goods, type of transfer speed. Question? No? Okay. Uh, still in the title and risk, in good terms, uh, they are terms that were created by the International Chamber, Chamber of Commerce in France, in Paris, ICC, and they are widely used in international transactions. They are also used in domestic ones, but mostly in international transactions. Those terms, they define not the title, but the risk. Who bears what? Who is responsible for what? Those are the input terms. So we have the CIF, cost, it means cost, insurance, and freight. If I buy goods, let's say I'm buying goods from China, CIF, it means the supplier is charging me for the goods, cost, for insurance, and for the freight. So it could be uh, air freight, could be uh, vessel by vessel, or could be transportation. So the price I'll be paying the supplier will include not only the cost of the goods, but also insurance and freight. If anything happens to the product, the supplier bears the risk until the products are delivered to me, until they reach the port of Vancouver, for example, or the airport of Vancouver. On the other hand, if I buy FOB free on board, the supplier is just charging for the cost of goods and the domestic transportation from their premises of business until the port of landing. Port could be a uh, port or an airport. I, the buyer, would have to secure insurance if I want the freight, if I want air freight or if I want um, vessel or if I want road transportation. And then if anything happens during the transportation, I, the buyer, I will bear the risk. Why? Because I purchased FOB, not CIF. Domestic uh, <clears throat> transactions, COD is used a lot, which is cash on delivery. So let's say I am the supplier of fresh croissants to your coffee shop, and we negotiated COG. So it means when I deliver the fresh persons to you, in the morning, you pay me cash. Right? So that's another type. There's actually, for the equal terms, there's over 20 types. There's exports, there's a lot of. So if you wanna um, go further into this, you can research uh, by equal terms. Uh, ICC, and you have the list of uh, all the income terms available. They are usually enforceable, or better, they are usually effective as by the year, the year they were published. The first one was published in 1936, but the current one that is effective is the 2010 one. There may be another one coming up very soon. So once they update them, the new one becomes enforceable. And it's not law, it's not a uh, legislation, but they are terms of a contract that are widely used. So whenever I buy CIF, I know the supplier is taking care of the insurance and the freight. I'll take, I'll just worry about clearing the goods and customs and then bringing it to my warehouse. Whereas if I purchase FOB, then I have to secure transport, I have to secure insurance if I want, etc. The bill of lending, this is not a term, this is not a contract, this is just a document that acknowledges receipt of the goods. So I purchase FOB or even CIF. When I receive the copy of this bill of lending, it is also known as BL, the acronym. I know the goods were ordered. I know the goods were received by the transportation company. 
but I don't know the quality of the goods. I may know the quantity of pallets or boxes, but I don't, I don't know the quality. So this is not a quality assurance document. It is just a document saying that the supplier delivered the goods for the transportation company to bring them to me. Okay? So it's not about quality. And it's not a term. The view of lending is not equal term. It's just this document that acknowledges receipt of the goods. In terms of uh, moving, uh, continuing with the Sale of Goods Act, we have five rules that are important uh, for us to know. Those five goods, uh, uh, those five rules, they apply to different transactions. So the first one is the unconditional contract. The unconditional contract is when title transfers immediately, regardless of the date of payment or delivery. So that's the example when you go to Ikea to buy something, when you go to um, Best Buy, when you go to any place, buy goods. Okay, That's an unconditional sale. You see the goods and you buy them. Clear? That's the first rule. Second rule is the when the task, when a task uh, has to be completed after the seller puts the goods in deliverable state. So the example here would be repair. So in a repair, I need to I need to have my smartphone repaired. So the repair shop, while they are repairing, they have the title or they have the temporary possession and a kind of a title. Uh, the title and the risk will only be with me after the service is delivered, after the repair is made. So you set your smartphone for repair, and then uh, unfortunately there was a break-in, a robbery in the repair shop, and your smartphone is lost, was um, stolen. So the risk was with the repair shop. You have to be compensated for that. Okay? So that's uh, the second rule. The third rule is when the seller has to either weigh or measure the products before uh, the buyer can know, uh, can get a knowledge or can get a knowledge about what he's actually buying. So this is very common for liquids, if you're buying uh, gas, gasoline, oil, or if you're buying grains. So let's say I'm buying, I'm purchasing two tons of soy or corn. So for me to know the price of a thing, the goods have to be either weighed or measured. So only after weighing or measuring that title will pass to me as a buyer. Before the goods are weighed or measured, the title is with the seller. So risk is with the seller as well. Okay? The other uh, rule is when goods have to be, uh, goods are subject to approval. This is uh, trying the goods. Uh, I went to chapters one of those days and my daughter wanted to buy this uh, Fitbit watch. I was not sure it was proper for her age, so the salesperson said, no, take it. You can use it, and in 14 days you can return it. Okay? So title only passed to us after the 14 days. For example, I could use it. Uh, some companies, they do, it, uh, they do this with furniture, you see the furniture, but you don't know if they are comfortable or if, if they will fit nicely in your house. So you can have the new sofa or mattress used for a while, and then you acknowledge that, yes, now I'm buying it. I tested it and I'm okay with it. So that's the fourth rule. And the last one is the example of the table. When you buy something that is in a showroom, you are not buying that product, you are buying a similar product. But the product has to be manufactured. So title will only pass after manufacturing, after it is delivered to you. This is um, also common uh, in my country at least for most types of furniture. 
most furniture uh, or decoration stores, they only have showroom items. You don't buy them. You just select the type you want, and then they will manufacture and deliver to you in a future date. Okay? So those are five rules. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say uh, better. I'm not saying you have to memorize all of them, uh, and mostly for your final exam. At least you have to uh, have an idea, sense of it. I won't be uh, questioning you on specific rules. Okay? Just have an idea on the uh, uh, types uh, of rules under the Sale of Goods Act. Rights and obligations of, of the parties. So, as I said, if there's a sale contract, the contract is the law, the contract applies. Only the gaps will be filled by the Sale of Goods Act. But if there's no written contract, then the Sale of Goods uh, Act will apply fully. But actually, in a contract, there are some terms that are implied in all sales transactions. So they cannot be contracted out. They cannot be eliminated by the parties. And those implied terms, they are usually related to conditions and warranties. And for you, this is just a review. You know that a condition is a major term, and if a condition is breached, can you get away from the deal, or you still have to go ahead with the deal? You can get out of it, right? Remember the example, you, you purchased a uh, Lamborghini, and they delivered you a Porsche. Porsche is still a nice car, but you order a Lamborghini, so a major term was breached, you don't need to buy the Porsche. And you can still sue for damages, right? And in terms of warranty, remember warranty a minor term. So in this uh, example, you purchase this new Porsche with leather seats, but they deliver to you with cloth seats. So in this uh, scenario, you have to go ahead with the deal, but you can get a discount or sue for damages. Those terms, <coughs> sorry, those terms under the Sale of Goods Act, they are implied. Parties cannot contract out. Parties cannot eliminate those uh, implied terms. Okay? They may use the exemption clauses, but you also know that exemption clauses, they are only effective first if they are brought to the attention of the party, in this case the buyer, so that the buyer can decide if they agree with that exemption or not. Okay? So exemption clauses will only work uh, this way. And there's also legislation that prevents uh, some exemptions in transactions, mostly for consumers. So a product has to have a minimum quality and has to be fit for the purpose. So even though Best Buy says that they are exempted from issues with the laptop they are uh, selling to you, if the laptop doesn't work properly, you are protected because this exemption clause would not work based on legislation. Okay? The product is implied to be fit for work and to have a minimum quality. Okay? Uh, so the seller will have some implied terms, some obligations that are also implied. And when I say implied, they are kind of automatic. They are there. And uh, even though parties did not make it express in an agreement, but they are there and they have to be complied with. And two uh, implied terms are good title and quiet possession. So good title and quiet possession means I, the seller, I do have the title. I own the goods. The goods cannot have any restrictions. If the goods have restrictions, I don't have good title. So I cannot sell. So the act implies that all goods that we buy, the seller had good title of it. And also quiet possession. Quiet possession means they could possess it without any restrictions either. Okay? So it's implied like this. And also goods, they have to be usable, and it's an implied term, free of liens, as we saw, so no restrictions at all. They have to match the description if you buy from a catalog. 
They have to match the description from the catalog you saw. They have to be of uh, merchantable quality and match the sample and they cannot have hidden defects. So you buy a laptop, the salesperson turned it on to you, you saw it was working, but if after some hours or days there was a defect that was hidden, was not clearly seen when you purchased, you are protected with it because it is an implied term. And in BC, uh, only in BC, there may be in other uh, provinces as well, but I'm sure in BC, the goods, they, are, they have to be durable. What durable is, is a bit subjective because you know you are marketing guys and you know you are going to be mostly uh, companies actually, they are creating products that are not so durable so that we can buy more and more. And you will be tasked with the duty to uh, create the demand for products that are not so durable. So imagine if we could, my mom, I think she had, she doesn't have it anymore, but she had a fridge for over 30 years, I think her first fridge. But that's not the case nowadays. Also because of the advancement of technology, but because products are not so durable as they were in the past, even cars, etc. But it is still in the law if you see products are implied, it is implied, that products have to be durable here in BC. Yes? Um, question for the match description part of this. Mm -hmm. um, quite often we see a few classic examples like remember uh, the advertisement, it looks like amazing, mm -hmm. but when you get it, you know, it doesn't look like that. Yeah. Wouldn't that be considered uh, not matching the description? Yes, it would. But companies may have learned their lesson. So they usually have a disclaimer. The product you buy will not necessarily look exactly as the one in the picture. Okay? So it's not in terms of, um, I'm not sure if beauty is the proper word, but it's uh, the description here is about what is the product made of? What are the components of the product? Not the picture. Uh, for example, when we see cars for sale, they usually say the car in the picture is not necessarily the one that uh, is for sale because the one may have more accessories and so forth. So companies will uh, work this out by having disclaimers. Okay? And on the top of that, also, as I said, the uh, components of the product, they have to match mostly. Not their appearance, there you go. Okay. Uh, some other implied terms. If there's no price, it doesn't mean the product is for free. We have to pay a reasonable price. This is very rare, but if it is the case, a reasonable price has to be paid. Time of delivery may be a condition or a warranty. And remember, parties may decide if a specific term is a condition, a major term, or just a warranty. Let's say you purchase a, um, a new laptop because you need it to use in your marketing presentation. So time is important for you. Delivery of that product is important. So you can set this as a condition. If they are late, you, are not, uh, you don't need to go ahead with the deal because they have breached that condition. Okay? So parties may decide. And the purchaser can choose to return or keep the goods when the wrong quantity is delivered. So I purchased uh, 12, uh, is it 12, a dozen, yeah, a dozen timbits, but they just delivered 10. So when this is the case, I can decide to keep the 10 and either have a discount or sue for damages, or, uh, yeah, or uh, just return the goods because the right quantity was not delivered. Okay, this is also an implied term. Satisfaction is not a right. Or to have the money back. They are not a right in the legislation. They are very common for some companies, but as a company policy. Like Home Depot, you can return the products, get a credit or your money back, up to 90 days. 
By the way, did I tell you this? This is real example. I went to Home Depot. I needed this um, pressure uh, pressure washer. Is it pressure washer, how you call it? I needed one. Huh. My wife did it, so actually. She wanted this. But the ones for uh, renting, they were just industrial ones, very powerful ones. So no, those will not work. So the salesperson said, no, go there, purchase one, use it during the weekend, and on Monday you come back and you return it. Said, what? Yes, you can do this. This is, but this is a company policy, right? So having money back, returning goods, or being satisfied with the product is not a right. Only when the sales salesperson uh, informs you that the product is fit for your purpose, then they are bound by their instructions. But if this is not the case, I believe Apple, Apple you have up to 30 days or 14 days to just return the goods, right? Yes. Did you buy it? What? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't find it uh, fair. And by the way, my wife wanted to fill up my weekend free time with some tasks at home, so I said, no, no, that's all right. this is not correct to do. Okay? But satisfaction is not a right. Okay? And also to have the money back there, not a right. So, question for you. the seller can retain the goods until they are paid for or if they are on, way, on their way to be delivered delivered may be stopped goods that are not paid yet they may be taken back by the seller so the seller sold 20 laptops to my company I would pay 30 days or I would pay just 10% of them and then the remaining balance in 30 days and then let's say it went bankrupt, I defaulted, so they can get back the products to recover. They have this preference. And because of this recovery right, we say that the seller has priority over the unpaid goods, over all other secured, secured creditors, and the sellers can also sue for breach of contract or for damages. Okay? But again, remember if you are a victim of a breach, you have a duty to mitigate the loss. So the customer made an order, I uh, manufactured the product, the customer didn't take the product, so breached our agreement. Uh, in this example, mitigating my loss would be trying or attempting to uh, resell the product to someone else. The buyer's remedies will be the same as in contract law. And there may be also damages for fraudulent misrepresentation. So intentionally the salesperson or the seller told you that the product had, had this, uh, those characteristics, but it didn't. Or it did that, it was fit for this, but they were not. So misrepresentation, false statements. Uh, buyers can also withhold payment. If a condition is breached, as you know, because they don't need to go ahead with the deal, but they do need to go ahead with the deal with a warranty. They can sue for damages, they can re request for a discount, as you already know. Online and uh, online sales and international transactions. So there's this, most provinces in Canada, they have uh, the International Sale of Goods uh, Act, but Again, if there's a contract, an international agreement for the sale of goods, the contract will be law. And this contract can override, can set aside the prescription of this act. And in terms of online purchases, when we click, I accept, 
Usually we are accepting the terms and conditions, etc. So it means we are accepting the agreement, the way it is. But remember that agreement is a form standard agreement, meaning that we actually don't have room to negotiate. You are purchasing something on Black Friday, you were purchasing, and then you decided to read the terms and conditions from Amazon just because you're taking the below lecture. So you want to know what the terms and conditions uh, say. There was a section you were just worried about. Did you try to reach out to Amazon to negotiate that section? You don't have this opportunity. So uh, consumer legislation will protect you because if they are abusive, you can challenge this in court uh, later on. Okay? But when you click I accept, you are accepting to that agreement. The agreement is closed. In terms of consumer protection, so most countries, they have consumer protection legislation because they understand consumers are the weakest parties in a consumer transaction. So the business is, is usually a stronger party. They are the ones usually drafting the agreement, uh, imposing their provisions. So we have consumer legislation to protect us. And this legislation will control use and disclosure of information, also advertisement, important for you, key for you, so how you advertise products. By the way, there's legal consultants or lawyers, I'm not the one, but there are some that are specialists in advertising laws. So how companies must advertise, uh, let's say, uh, products that may be dangerous to kids, or medicines, or drugs, or anything. So, the consumer uh, legislation is, is the one that this lawyer will be very knowledgeable about. Also, this legislation protects uh, or controls safety and quality of products and unethical business pra uh, practices. And to protect consumers in Canada, we have both federal legislation and provincial legislation. So both of them apply uh, to consumer transactions. In terms of federal legislation, calling your attention to the Competition Act. So this act is intended to prevent business activities that may interfere in the free market. Let's say all coffee shops here at BCAT Tim Hortons, the Ritz, and all others, uh, they stand, they get together and they agree that the minimum price for a small coffee is six dollars. <laughs> this is a type of cartel. This is not allowed. So the Competition Act is there. It's there to protect interference in the market. Also, when companies are merging, when one company is buying the other, let's say Tim Hortons, uh, no, Starbucks wants to buy Tim Hortons. There, there may be concentration in only one company for the supply of coffee and coffee products. So this transaction, for example, and by the way, in one of your sets, there was a group that presented something on the uh, Competition Act and issues, mergers, yes. So in this transaction, for example, Companies would need, Starbucks would need to get the approval of governmental authorities for this transaction to take place. Am I a little bit correct? There are requirements, uh, assets uh, threshold or revenue, but yes, because the Competition Act intends <coughs> to keep the market as free, as most free as possible. Okay, no illegal uh, interference. And also abusive trade practices such as cons conspiracy, bait and switch advertising, they are prohibited. Pirate selling, and I won't go further into this, but I did share uh, the definition of those with you. The bait and uh, switch advertising, and also pirate selling, they are prohibited in Canada. Okay, so you can read uh, definitions later on. There is also under the Competition Act civil and criminal uh, proceedings if you uh, commit any of the offenses and they, will, they may also apply to online sales depending on the jurisdiction. 
for the provincial legislation, so the sale of goods act will impose some responsibility on the sellers and victims of products that are not safe, they may be able to sue the manufacturer under tort. Okay? We are not buying from the manufacturer directly. So we don't have a, a contract with the manufacturer. Thus, we cannot sue on contract, but we can sue on tort. On tort, if we prove the manufacturer was negligent, they were at fault. Okay? So there was a duty, that duty was breached, causation and damages. But if you buy the product, you were the one buying, and I, if I'm not mistaken, you had a similar question in midterm one, uh, that example about the realtors or sale agents. They purchased muffins, one purchased muffin, but the muffin was not good. The, the lady who ate the muffin. So she could not sue in contract. But if she was sick, she could sue in tort for damages. He who bought the muffins could sue in contract law for breach because the product was not good, was not in good form. Okay? Some accept unacceptable business practices, so false or exaggerated claims. Again, you marketing consultants, marketing professionals. I know you usually follow instructions from your clients, from your employers, but remember you took the B-Law course when you were uh, studying? So remember that they cannot have exaggerated claims, such as this medicine heals everything, for example. So it's actually exaggerated. And then the uh, consumer boards, provincial ones, they may investigate complaints they get from uh, consumers, from people. Also, unconscionable transactions. Remember uh, the example, uh, you decide to buy a uh, printed magazine subscription for $2,000, the yearly subscription. This just sounds unconscionable. In principle, no one would do that. It is not a void contract, but it's a voidable, because in principle, you were taken advantage of. So, or another example, if you get a loan and the repayment terms is that you pay 60% interest per year. 60% may be okay in other countries, but not in Canada. So it is presumed it was a pension. Okay? Uh, legislation also protects. And the cost of borrowing money, it's mandatory to be disclosed. So the example I have for you, and the letters here are small, because this is the way companies comply with this obligation. They do it in very small uh, letters, but they are complying with this mandatory uh, disclosure of cost of borrowing money. Okay? And by the way, it doesn't mean I like or I love uh, Subaru. It's just the first example I got my bed, so I have it there. You know I prefer the number of videos. I use more of those examples. Uh, control business uh, practices, and this is uh, to finish. So the legislation will also control some specific types of business activities, such as door-to-door -door sales. They are restricted, and uh, they are not prohibited, but they are restricted, so there are, there's a lot of restriction on them. Uh, one of them is, for example, there's a cooling off period. So if I buy something from a door-to-door -door salesperson, I have up to 10 days after my purchase to change my mind and cancel. If it is a subscription or if it is a product, I am buying. And also referral uh, selling. Referral selling is, I'll give you a discount if you buy my product, but also share with me contact details of five more people. 10 more people. So I'm giving marketing uh, tools or marketing information for the company. And in exchange of this, I'm getting a discount. So companies that do this, they have to be licensed. And if they are abusive in doing this, they are forcing you to do this. No, you can only buy the product if you share contact details. They may be fined for doing this. You may have this option, but you may not be obliged or obligated to do this. 
Okay. Uh, just some more. I'll, uh, I'll go just before negotiable instruments. For loan transactions, so as I already showed, uh, true cost of borrowing money has to be disclosed, misleading information is prohibited, and money lenders, they have to be registered. So this is a way the government or the state is controlling some of those uh, business activities. For debt collection uh, agencies or uh, companies, so they have to be both registered and licensed. And when you are, uh, when the collector comes to talk to you or uh, to get payment, they may commit some torts. So they may uh, use the information. Let's say they call your company to speak with you, and someone else has answered the phone and says, oh, no, he's not here. Oh, OK, so just, can you just tell uh, him that I'm the debt collector, and he's been only for this time, this year. And if it is false, or if this part of the statements are false, you may sue for defamation. Or if they come to your house and say, hey, I'm going to keep you in prison there if you don't pay me. Or I'm going I'm to go to uh, your children's school and uh, kidnap uh, them. So yes, all those things can happen. So criminal offenses can also be committed there. You may also have tort remedies. Okay. So negotiable instruments, if it's OK with you, I'll just put it on video. Right? Guys, thank you so much for the term. Uh, my apologies for, well, some of the boring lectures, apologies for English as a second language, but one thing I would like you to keep with you for your lives, you know, law is both important and relevant, and if you don't know what the issue is about, at least now you know where to get the information. You know you can research more, you can look at case law, you have books, you have handouts, and etc. Okay? So all the best in your future studies here at PCAT, and I'll see you in the final exam. I may share some more news in the final exam with you in the next days. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.